Hey everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Once again, my name is Jonathan Duvall, and I'm excited to be hosting the second part of our webinar series on the BrightScript Profiler. So last week we covered how to collect memory and CPU usage data with the BrightScript Profiler. And this week, we're going to show you how to drill down into the data collected with the Profiler and find code in your channel application that is consuming too many resources. So if you missed last week's webinar or you wanna go back and rewatch it, you can view it on demand from the Roku Developers YouTube channel, the developer portal or on device channel. And of course we are recording today's webinar and we'll also post on these different platforms by tomorrow for on demand viewing. Now, if you do watch our YouTube channel, please make sure to subscribe to get notified when we publish our webinars next month. So just like last week, we're going to play a pre-recorded video where Jeff Dunn, our senior software engineer here at Roku and the creator of the BrightScript Profiler, and he's gonna talk about analyzing the data collected with the Profiler. And when Jeff's done, we'll do a live Q&A session where Jeff answers your questions. Now, please be aware that while we will not comment on a roadmap or making other forward-facing commitments during the Q&A session, we do welcome future requests and other suggestions around what would make the tool even more useful for you. As a reminder, during the webinar, your video and audio will be muted throughout. If you have any questions about the material being covered, please enter them in the Q&A window in Zoom. You can also use Zoom's built-in raise hand feature, which will allow me to enable you to unmute your audio and ask questions directly to Jeff. When using this feature, be mindful that all attendees on today's webinar will be able to hear your question and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. All right, I think we're all set. Jeff Dunn, everybody. All right, thank you, Jonathan. As Jonathan mentioned, this is part two of our uh, BrightScript profiling webinars. And what we're doing here is we're looking more in, into analyzing the data that we generate from the profiler. So it's worth mentioning again why this is so important. Uh, as, as you mentioned previously, these devices are inexpensive and by definition cannot be terribly powerful. So it's important that they have good performance on the whole range of devices. And hopefully as you all know that you need to test your, your channel, your test your channels on low end devices before before shipping. So in this particular webinar, we're actually going to uh, generate data for some more complex data structures and deal with larger data sets and how to manage that data because you can end up with a large amount of data and figuring out what's important in there can be quite difficult. So we're gonna, we're gonna try to cover some topics that'll get you started in that, that, that direction. Uh, ultimately, as you'll see, we go through this, it's, it's up to the channel developer to figure out what's going on. Unfortunately, just like any other bug, if you've got a performance bug, it can be sometimes challenging to figure out what's going on on any platform. So we, try, we think we provide you with uh, ample amounts of data to solve these problems. So today we're gonna to look at a relatively complicated channel, certainly more complicated than the one in the first, the first session and how to focus on one section of your UI. Very often you'll have one problematic part of your UI you need to test. So we're gonna look into that. And a lot of the, what we're doing today is uh, informed by what we've seen on production channels, problems that channels typically have. And that said, much, without any more ado, we're gonna get into our live demo. Okay, so first of all, let's just run our channel. I've got this nice little channel here, so let's zip it up. It's, so anybody who's done any BrightScript channel development, uh, this should look very, fairly familiar to them. We're not doing anything particularly unusual here. So I'm gonna to go to my application installer and I am going to upload my new file. And load it. And let's look at the output of our device. So the only option in this channel is to play some video, which is what Roku does. So we're going to play some video and we're waiting and we're waiting, and we're waiting. Ah, and there's the cat. So <laughs> quick aside, I was looking for a clip. I knew I needed a short clip to repeat here. And um, so I was looking for a clip to uh, that we had the rights to and I realized I've got a cat and I have a cell phone. So problem solved, this is my cat. <laughs> so my first cat video uploaded to the internet. So we played some video and we stopped. 
So one of the things we saw there, one, when I pressed OK, it took quite a while for the video to start. So why, why is that? So let's, let's dig into the profiler and see if we can figure it out. And for the purposes of this demo, I am going to use the downloaded version of the visualizer tool. As I mentioned in the previous session, um, this tool can be run on the web. It's like I accidentally started two of them there. Okay. This tool can be run on the web, and it actually works for the data sets we're going to use today. It probably work, it would work fine on the web. The local tool is a little faster, so if you have larger data sets, it's just a little bit quicker to use. So that's what I shall do. So I've already selected my device. Let's show how that works, though, really quickly. So, this, so if I just say online devices, it finds my nearby devices. The device I'll be using today is a Roku 3 model 4200. Um, it's a very common device in the field. It's um, kind of a medium powered device. It's low powered by today's standards, but uh, it's been around for a while. I find it really good for testing because um, it's closer to the low end than a lot, of, a lot of the newer devices. So it makes it easier to test for low end problems. So we have our device selected. Now let's go ahead and sideload our channel. And so, as we mentioned, uh, some of these features in the previous session, uh, we're going to leave line level on. I always leave that on. Uh, nowadays, with the, the current versions of the OS and the profiler, um, line level profiling usually works fine. If your program is running too slowly with pro profiling turned on, you can uh, turn this off to make it run a little faster. And I'm going to go ahead and turn off memory profiling for now because we're actually looking at um, time, why this is taking so long to run. So let's just start her up. And let's go back to the device. So one thing I noticed if I started this up, the uh, the profiler, the visual visualization tool, I started up in live stream mode. So it actually is showing me Oh, actually, CPU data, it won't show live. I'll show, when we start going into memory, you'll see live data pop up here. There are various reasons why it doesn't necessarily show CPU data while it's running. But, uh, well, we'll show that with CPU data. So now I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And there's our delay. Now, why is that taking so long? And there's our video. So I'm just going to press back to kill the channel. And the tool gives me the option to save the file. I usually save it in case something crashes as I step on the device or whatever. Um, this way you've got your data. Let's go ahead and save it. Now what we're wondering about here is actually wall clock time. So these columns here for time are uh, actual wall clock time as received by the user, not CPU time. And that's actually what we're concerned about here. right? We, we, obviously, if it's because of CPU, we need to fix that. But let's drill down first on why it's taking so much time. And if we look at our time, let's look in thread one here. So this takes 35 seconds. What is what is spending 35 seconds? And it says main. We're going to click on our dot, dot, dot here. And it says that there are really two functions, uh, line 25 and line 28, that seem to be taking a significant amount of time. So let's go and look at that file. And that is in main. So line 25 is your screen dot show here. Um, what that's saying is it's taking about one second to show the screen. Generally, that's OK. If you go from user pressing OK or select to a populated UI in a second, that's fine. So we're going to not worry about that. What's this 35 seconds here? That is line 28. Um, that's actually in this wait. So those of you, those of you who have written bright script channels know that this wait is just waiting on a message port. It's, the user is actually not waiting on this. It's just this is the main loop that's always there and it's just waiting for things to happen. They're apparently not happening. So that doesn't look interesting to us. Uh, let's come down and look at um, this one spending five seconds. Let's look in here. So it looks like it's something maybe in login done. I'll tell you what. Um, so what's going on here, and this is one of the things that we wanted to talk about, is that when you've got a large data set, it can be hard to figure out where your problems are occurring. So I'm, I'm worried about this 
several second delay when I press OK to play a video. Um, and I'm seeing a 35 second delay that is kind of polluting my data. So what I'd like to show is the pause and resume functions. So what we want to do is we actually want to profile one specific part of our channel. So let's go ahead and say pause on start. And what that means is that, so that this gets a, there's a little, there can be a little bit of confusion here. When you've got network mode turned on, which we do, um, the Roku OS always pauses. It displays the splash screen for the channel, but it does not run the channel until it gets a network connection where it can send data. This is not what this is referring to. Uh, pause on start means that it will not send. So it makes the connection, but it will not send profiling data until you resume the data, until you, until you resume the profiling. And the reason for that is so that you can do exactly what we need to do here, which is I want to see the data for this one section of my UI. So let's say pause on start. And we're going to select our channel, same channel, no modifications. And we're going to say side load. Side load the channel. And OK. And again, oops, here's our output from our device. And we're waiting and waiting. Finally, the video starts. OK, so. And one, one trick here, by the way, that I found. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to, I forgot to start the profiling. So I need to do that again. Sorry, let me, let me start this over. So we started this channel paused with profiling paused. And you'll notice up here it says profiling is paused. And we want to resume it. We want to resume it. We hit this button. So the what this means is that up till now we have not stored any profiling data. So now that we want, we found the part of the channel that we want to profile, which is after we press OK here. Let, let's go ahead and hit resume. So now we're generating profiling data. And I will hit OK. And we're waiting and waiting and waiting. And it started. Now I'll pause profiling. So one trick that I that I showed you there was you want to do the paw or the resume and pause as close to the section you want to profile as possible. So as soon as I got through my five second delay that I'm worried about, I, I pause the programming. So now no no more data is being generated. So now I will hit stop profiling and download the file just for the heck of it. So now if we look at our data, there you go. There's our five seconds, right? There's that that takes a lot of the pollution out of the data. And we're going to go in here and take a look. And it says that it's in run. And it looks like it's in line 109. This, and I just happen to know that this file is, um, I believe this is sample video.brs. <laughs> no, it's not. It must be, it's in uh, main scene BRS 109. So there's the thing. If you go on the previous screen, it'll show you what. Um, It'll show you which file you're in. So this is actually shows you remote data.brs. So let's go back in here. So we know we're remote data.brs, and it looks like line 109 is the problem. So let's look at line 109. And here we have sleep of five seconds. So obviously this is the problem. You just take the sleep out, but this is what this this is intended to simulate a slow back end. What this is actually doing is it's simulating a login. So if you notice that I basically when I go to play the video, it logs into the, the theoretical um, backend content delivery network or whatever the backend server is. Um, and that takes five seconds, five seconds to do. So the question is, can we avoid that wait? So this is where a lot of this, again, we can provide you with the data, but the channel developer really has to know how the channel works to be able to, to solve the problems. So in this case, what's happening is that we are doing a, a login to the server and 
I need to look at main scene BRS. So we do the login. So the question is, normally I do button selected and then we begin because I wrote this channel. I know that I'm jumping around a little bit, um, but there's really no way around that. You just have to know how the channel works. And when you're de debugging your channel, it's just like a de debugging performance is a lot like debugging any other bug. You just have to know how the channel works and dig in. So normally what's happening now is you hit button selected and it does a login. It tells the remote data connection. In this case, it's a simulated connection. By the way, this channel doesn't do any network access. Everything is, is local within the channel. So I do a do login and it has to wait for the login to complete before it can actually, actually start the video. So one trick that we can use, of course, is perhaps when I initialize my UI in the first place, I'm going to go and do the login then because I know who the user is, right? Hopefully. Um, once they logged in, you know who they are, obviously. You probably stored that data in the uh, on the device. So now what's going to happen is as soon as I populate my UI, it's going to start the login process. So let's go back over to our normal debugging port, which is 8085, of course. So we can see what's going on. But let's sideload the channel again. Same channel. And let's not pause on start this time. Let's just let it run and see what happens. So side of the channel. And output of the device. And I forgot to zip up the channel. Okay, so we still have the problem. The problem, the reason that um, we still have the issue is that I, I modified the channel, but I didn't zip it up. So let's go back and try this again. And what I, what I was looking for here is there's a, a print in there when the authorization is complete. So in this case, my UI is up. I'm about to hit OK. And you notice the video starts right away. So the login sequence finished right about the time. By the time I hit OK, the login finish sequence had finished. So there was no delay that time when I pressed OK because obviously it, took, it still took five seconds to log in, but it happened in the background. So there's one problem solved. OK, so one of the things I've notice with this channel, it uses a lot of memory during startup. It uses about three megabytes of memory during startup. Um, and it's a fairly small channel. It shouldn't be doing that. Let's see if we can figure out why it's doing that. So let's load our channel. It's the same channel. It's, we definitely want memory profiling turned on and line level data because you want to know which specific lines if you can are, are doing the memory operations. Again, usually leave this on unless you find that it's slowing down uh, your channel too much. Memory profiling does slow down the channel pretty significantly. Um, and that's because it just generates a lot of data. So there's really no way around that. But just keep in mind, if you turn on memory profiling, uh, it will slow your channel down while the profiling is on. So let's go and load this guy. I don't need the previous data. I'm going to go memory here. And if you'll notice, looking on the memory tab, um, this is actually a live view of the data that's coming in. If you look at it, these numbers are going up. Um, and our video is now, uh, our, our channel is now up. And it says that um, in that process, we've, we've allocated 2.4 megabytes of memory um, that we don't know. And we don't know if we need it or not. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. I think it's worth looking at these column headers. So these are similar to CPU and time, but there are some subtle differences. Uh, so alloc self is what you'd expect. It's the amount of memory allocated within that function body itself, the total memory allocated within that function body, um, the amount of memory freed within that function itself. And then this free other is memory that's freed anywhere in the system that was allocated within that function body. Uh, generally, these two columns, the free columns, it's, very, it's rare that you need to look at them directly. What you want is this unfreed column. So this unfreed self, what it tells you is the amount of memory that was allocated in the function body itself 
but never freed anywhere in the system. And again, it's up to the channel developer to decide whether that's a leak memory that won't be used or if it's just valid memory that we still need. Um, and then the total columns are similar, uh, except they are the call graphs in that function and below. So for instance, in this case, let me widen this window a little bit. In this case, init allocates 3,920. Well, in its whole call hierarchy, uh, let's look at one of these that actually has a variance from, so here we go, and this init here. It only allocates 1,264 megabytes of 1,264 bytes of memory itself, but in all the call hierarchy below it, this total number, it allocates 4.4 megabytes of memory, almost 4.5. Um, and when, we're, when all is told, we're still left with 2.3 megabytes being used. So let's figure out what that might be. Let's drill down in here. Uh, still getting some big numbers. So again, you what I'm looking for is I'm looking at this total column. And what I want to find is I want to drill down till I get something that has a, a bigger unfreed self number, right? I want to find the actual function that's allocating this stuff that's not being freed. So let's keep going down. Now, this is clearly a recursive function. Um, I know this complicate things, complicates things a, a bit, but again, this isn't that uncommon. This simulates a hierarchy of content, a program guide, if you were, if you would. Uh, you know, it's a tree. This is pretty typical for what we, you know, pretty typical in data in the industry. You either have categories or genres or uh, times. And so you end up with these trees of content or series with children. You end up with these trees of content. And let's drill on down in here. We finally reached the bottom. And we do see some numbers here. We see um, a couple of these that, so this thing, Add program children and sell it says itself is allocating you know two megabytes of memory and of that 1.2 is never free so let's take a look at that we go in here um it says line 94. so let's look at 994 and again what this is this program doesn't actually do any network access it's all simulated so that it can be self-contained um, demo. So if we look in here, line 86, uh, no, I'm sorry, I said 90, sorry, 94. That is calling populate program node. And this is another hint that something's going on here. Let's click in here. And that's saying lines 107 and 108. Now, this is interesting. So this is telling us that set fields and add fields are taking a significant amount of our memory that's not being freed here. Um, so basically, What it looks like is, you know, we've got this content, this, this we've got this content, this hierarchy of content. What's, I mean, what's a common solution to this is maybe we don't need all this data while the channel is running. You know, we, maybe we need to collect the data and we're going to pull out the bits we really care about and we're going to save those and discard the rest. There are obviously more efficient ways to do that. You know, better to do it on the back end and not send the data to the device, but sometimes that's not possible. So let's say we're in a real world situation here. We've got all this data and we need to trim it down. So after we load the data, can we do anything to trim it down? Um, just happens I have this program that I pre-wrote because I don't have the time to, to do it during the demo, of course. But basically, let's just remove all the children. We just, we're saying that we're going to put everything we need into that, that root content node and remove all of its children, let them just go away. So let's get rid of that. Um, and if you notice, we've got this print here that says we're trimming the data so we can verify that we're looking at the right function. So let's save that, let's zip it up. And our profiler tool seems to be having an issue here. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and restart that. Okay, so let's go back to stream mode, sideload our channel. Again, we want memory and line memory profiling with line data for sure. Sideload, let's watch our device, see what it does. And again, if we look at memory, this should live, it'll tell us uh, what's going on with this channel. The channel starts. I'm not sure if I mentioned this unknown thread here uh, 
previously. But what this is, is the system doing cleanup. The only thing you should ever see on this is a freeze. We're not even going to look at that. Basically, your script allocates to memory, creates objects, whatever. Uh, we attribute that, that to the script. In some cases, those objects are then deferred for destruction by the system. When the system destroys them, they get attributed to this unknown thread. So we, they, we know they've been freed. Generally, you can ignore that. Um, OK, so let's look back now. This looks a little better, but there's still an awful lot of memory here. Let's look at our channel and make sure that we actually, yeah, it says trimming program data. And yet we're still seeing an awful lot of memory here. Um, this time let's go in. Uh, so this, this, this screen is often uh, very useful. It gives you the overview of all your threads and what they're doing. However, I find often the best place to look to start is top offenders. Uh, because that automatically just gives you the the things that are that seem to be causing the most issues. Let's say top offenders, and it actually is already unfreed total, um, and that's really what we care about. Um, actually, let's try unfreed self. So again, unfreed total. Uh, total is the amount allocated by a function and everything it calls. Self is the things that are allocated within that function. So we have these two functions, and they're the same functions we looked at last time. Um, that have allocated a bunch of memory that aren't freed. So let's look at this. And this uh, ellipsis here, the dot, 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 should always give you the line data. So it says basically the same thing it did before. So what could be going on here? So this is where you have to understand how your program works, right? So we've got the data. We know this is happening. The question is why? So my next theory is that we actually, when we populated the data, um, when we populated the node, we set its parent field. So if I go down here to this function, we have populate program node. We set this parent field. Now it turns out what that does is it creates a cycle, a reference cycle. So that the parent references its child and then in this case, we've set the, the child to now reference its parent. When we discard all those nodes, we're actually just discarding a bunch of object cycles, reference cycles that their reference counts never go to zero, right? I'm, at least two objects that refer to themselves, each other, they both have a reference count of one, it'll never go to zero. So the channel cannot use that memory again. Well, this does garbage collection, but that's a whole other it's a whole other topic and we won't get into that. It's better to avoid leaking the memory in the first place. So what we're saying is that we think we have a memory cycle, that we have this graph of content nodes, parents reference their children, and then the parents, the children also have references back to their parents. So how do we break that? I found it's always good practice when, it's always good practice when in a reference counted system and definitely in bright script, to clear all of your references. When you're freeing uh, data structures, just break all your references and make it easy on the garbage collector. Make it easy for the system to, re, to reacquire that memory. So of this, uh, again, pre-canned function, functions here, recursively goes through our, our graph, our, our graph of um, content nodes and sets our references to be invalid. And let's, let's use a different, uh, and this also has a print in here that says trim, print, trimming program data redux. So we know that we've got the right version of our program. And then up here we need, of course, after we load our program data, we now say trim our program data and let's use our second version of that function to do so. So what I'm doing is right here, I've changed this to trim program data too. Now let's zip this guy back up and sideload the new version. Why don't we look at our device again? There we go. I'm going to say sideload the channel. And no, I don't need the previous file. So our channel is starting up. Piece of memory coming across, it's getting bigger. And then if you notice at the end there, it dropped. 
right? So now we're, we're only using 59 kilobytes of memory, which is a lot better than 1. 1.9 megabytes of memory or whatever it was that we were leaking previously. So as the channel developer, again, it's up to the channel developer to decide what memory is necessary. Um, I would say that, you know, 60 kilobytes of memory um, is fine, right? I need some data to be able to drive my channel and know what the user might want to watch. And that concludes our demo. So I'm going to hand it back to Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. All right. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was fabulous. Hopefully everyone found that video useful. Um, before we dive into the Q&A, once again, uh, just want to point out that we are working on hashing out the resolution issues. We tried a few things today, uh, broadcasting from Roku headquarters, and obviously there's still a few kinks that we need to work out. Uh, as a reminder, um, you can watch this webinar on demand from our Roku Developers YouTube channel, our on-device channel, and the developer portal in stunning HD. Uh, so anyway, so once again, you know, we'll, we'll work on that and try to resolve that before we do any future webinars. Uh, all right. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the questions we received during the webinar. Um, and then we'll finish with the questions that you guys can ask. Uh, once again, you know, go ahead, please ask your questions in the Q and A. Um, and then we can, or you can also use the raise hand feature and I'll pick on you. Cool. So let's see, our first question is from, let's take a look here, one, um, from Ijo Jose, uh, he asked, uh, Jeff, he asked, is there any known issue with the memory profiling on Roku OS 9.4 firmware? I was able to successfully do mem mem memory profiling uh, with 9.3, uh, but, it crashes this device after the 9.4 update. Uh, CP CPU profiling works fine though. Any thoughts on memory profiling working on 9.4? I don't know of any issues. Uh, in fact, I, I, unfortunately it's been a week since I've done this, did the demo, but I, I always try to go to the latest firmware. So it should have been on 9.4. That demo should have been on 9.4. Right. But for future presentations, we'll actually be sure to specify the firmware we're using. So I, I don't know of any issues though. Um, that's concerning, obviously. All right. Uh, let's see here. So, uh, you know, let me go ahead and I'm going to allow you to talk and talk with Jeff directly. So I'm going to uh, allow you to talk. So feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, hey, thank you, Jonathan. Um, thank you, Jeff. So this, this is really good. <laughs> And thank you for presenting this. This is this is give us like you know really a good opportunity uh, to understand the um, like you know memory savings that which we could do on our app. Um, so I was just wondering a couple of things. So the, as I mentioned in the chat, like you know we have this problem that which I, I was able to successfully uh, profile it. Like you know I I went back to like you know a few months ago uh, a build and like you know I retried on nine point four and. It, that is also crashing. Um, so it, it, it starts for a few seconds and then it just crashes the box itself. Um, I tried in different boxes like uh, memory stick and uh, an ultra and a Roku 2 as well and all behaves the same way after the 9.4 update. Just FYI. Um, so one more Actually, follow up question I have. Sorry, if I could um, ask you one question about that. Are you streaming the data to the network or using data desk equals network? Yes. Oh, okay. Because yeah, that. Yes. Well, in that case, uh, that's the only thing I could think of that should cause that problem. So yeah, I don't know why you would be seeing that. Sorry. Right. Uh, oh, so you meant uh, yeah? I tried both. Like, and I tried to do local and network. Um, and local, I thought like local also crashes, and I thought local might be like you know it's dumping huge data, and that might be the device is cr crashing. Right. Um, so network seems to be uh, it. It starts um, and always like you know the memory profile data says like you know it is a corrupted data and it loads some amount of uh, like you know few few lines of data and then that's it. Um, I tried live streaming and also like you know from the tool directly and also try to do it like you know save as a file and try to load it and it's all same. Um, 
So, um, and one more question, follow-up question I have is like, you know, so what happens if we have like, you know, third-party component libraries or anything like that, uh, even on, on this, uh, like, you know, the, the apps that which we are trying to profile, like, you know, would that give us um, red flags of, uh, like, you know, this, this third-party component might be screwing up your app? Uh, so by third-party component, you mean a, um, like a, what do you, what do you mean by a third-party component? Com component, component libraries, oh, okay. right? Like um, which we, we include. So those should show up. Um, so it very, it very much behaves like the debugger as far as security goes. So you'll see uh, function names. Um, so no, yes, it should show those just like any other call stack. Basically those become part of your, part of your channel and they should show up in the normal course of profiling. Um, and there's some security things that, you know, some things will get, um, get obfuscated, but function names should be there, which is typically what you need. Function names and I believe line numbers. And would we be concerned, like, you know, if we are providing third party libraries to other other people? Um, we, we don't think so. No, we've intentionally tried to make sure that's not the case. So again, it's similar to the debugger. You know, if you're in the debugger and, it, and something crashes in one of those component libraries, again, you'll see a call stack, but no local variables, no uh, proprietary information. So uh, it shouldn't, we, we believe we've covered all those, those uh, concerns about security of, of third party libraries and access to the code from other, other, other access to the code to, you know, other, and to, and to other people, you should, they should not see it. It shouldn't be a security concern. Okay. And also how about RAF, right? Like, you know, the, um, if, if we, should we be worried about if we see something on like, you know, reference to the RAF uh, on our memory um, memory footprint? Uh, it should, it would find that. Uh, basically RAF uh, is another, you know, it's, as you know, it's a system library essentially. And so, but it will show up and the same, the same rules apply. You won't see any code, you won't see any local variables, um, but it, it would find potentially problems in RAF. We hope there are no problems in RAF. You know, we obviously, um, you work hard to, make RAF perform well and, and not overuse resources. And if we see something, so like, you know, should we like, you know, do we have opportunities to report it to Roku? Is that what you would say? I would, I would, yeah, if you see something you see that you think is a significant um, performance problem with RAF or any other system library, I, I, yeah, I would think you could report that as a bug. Yeah, personally, I consider performance problems a bug just like any other bug, you know, it's, it's, often not as serious as a crash, but it can be, you know, if, uh, if something, you know, we haven't seen this in our system libraries, uh, but, you know, if a library were doing that, you know, it could cause performance to be poor enough and eventually cause low memory conditions that I would consider any form of significant performance problems to be a bug that could be reported like any other bug. Okay, thank you. Um, just one more question and I, I promise I'll stop. Uh, is there a, is there a ch uh, you know, chance we would be adding um, memory snapshots to the to or snapshot ability like you know to see uh, how much memory consumption happened between like you know two instances or that's not relevant on uh, Roku box when you think well as um, Jonathan mentioned we're not we don't really this, in this in this webinar we, we're going to avoid any forward uh, potential future uh, commitments. Um, I would say if those are things that you're interested in, then yeah, then then send those along and we'll definitely consider those. Yeah, we'll make a note of that as a sort of a future request. So thanks for that. Cool, thank you, thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, and those, things, those things are very good to know. So thank you for bringing that up. And you know, if, if you know, we hear about features that would be useful for people, absolutely we'll consider them. Thank you. Cool, hey, thanks for, thanks for the questions, appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Um, not seeing any other questions. Uh, not still, you know, great opportunity to directly interact with uh, Jeff here. So feel free if you have any other questions. You know, you can enter them in the Q and A window, or you can raise your hand. We'll call on you, and you can directly interact with Jeff. So, um, any other questions? So one, one quick thing that I would like to note is there were several points in the, so we're working through this, some of these videos, this is all new, right? So we're working through some of the improvements we'd like to make. There are a number of times on the screen, I say, oh, look at this number here. And I was actually pointing to it with my mouse cursor. Um, 
And I don't think that was obvious. So just keep that in mind when you're watching it. Um, you might have to look for what I was referring to specifically. We'll, we'll work on that in the future. There are a number of ways we can work around, work on that in future webinars. Actually, I will say that uh, as when we publish the video, um, we'll try to highlight those mentionings of the line number. So we'll, we'll get our crack editing staff on that to ensure that those things are highlighted so that it's easier to understand as we're pointing out different line numbers. So we'll make that easier for the viewers when you guys watch this again. All right. Uh, once again, I'm gonna, this may be the last call for questions. Feel free, enter them in the Q&A window or Oh, you has got one more question. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, you know. Yeah, my name is Dijo again. Oh, Dijo, um, sorry so, about that. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, but uh, just one more thing. Um, so from your video, you mentioned that like, you know, invalidating the, um, invalidating the references on like, you know, at the, at the end of the optimization, right? Um, so, do you think that is significant that which whenever we are um, like, you know, dereferencing a, a parent, should we be assigning it to invalid in write script? Uh, why I'm asking is we normally don't do that in our app. Like, you know, we were expecting like, you know, it will be garbage collected uh, or like, you know, um, reference counted, sorry, no garbage, <laughs> uh, reference counted. So um, do you think would that be anything um, helpful, like, you know, if we assign it to invalid? Uh, yes, I, I typically consider that a best practice. Whenever I, in any of these reference counting systems, um, whenever I release a reference to something and I expect it to be freed, I, any references that it has, I typically try to try to clear those all out because it just makes it simpler for the entire system. Um, even in a system that has, you know, uh, um, you know, some of these, not bright script, but some systems have some very robust and smart garbage collectors, but they can actually be fairly expensive. So making it as easy on the garbage collector as, as possible is, is, is always best, I, I think. I always do it in my code. Um, I think I would say is, you know, bright script does have a function run garbage collector. Um, so that probably would, that should catch these cycles, but that can be fairly heavyweight. Um, and your channel has to do it manually. Most channels don't do that because they're managing that can be very difficult. So typically, short answer is yes. I consider it a best practice if you free something that you expect to be released or you, you drop a reference to something that you expect to be freed. I usually, if it's compli complicated at all, um, I always clear the outbound references from that object. Oh, thank you. That, like, you know, th that's something this we were doing wrong all, all these days, thinking that, like, you know, System right. will take well, care of it. Yeah, it may or may not be an issue. It depends on your system. But if you clear the references, then it won't be a problem, right? Usually, it's it's not. Usually, it's an easy thing to do, relatively easy, and it can avoid a lot of problems. And is that the same case if we remove like you know scene graph components from the like you know from the UI and also content nodes, and and the fields that which we like you know kind of observe or like you know uh, all those stuff. Uh, in general, I would say no. If you're using our platform APIs, they're pretty good about it. Like observers will get cleaned up. Um, but for instance, if you, and content nodes, well, again, with content nodes or AAs can have this issue, associative arrays can have this issue as well. You can have one AA that has a reference to another AA um, and those can create a cycle as well. So um, I, I guess I, I would say that our platform APIs are very good about this. So if you're if you're using the platform API directory not directly and not adding fields that reference other objects, you shouldn't have to worry about it. I wouldn't I wouldn't go out of your way to clear the fields that are set by the platform. Okay, and how about like you know we have a practice at which we extend the nodes like you know especially content nodes for like as a data object. Mm -hmm. um, do you see? Um, any red flags on that, like, you know, when you, when we are freeing up? No, I, there shouldn't be any issues there. Uh, again, unless, unless your subclass, your extended object has references to other objects that could be holding them in memory. And again, these cycles, you know, it's not always an issue, but it, it is a common problem, especially as channels get more and more 
bigger and more complicated. Uh, you, you just, it's, just, it's sometimes hard to even know where you're where you're putting these cycles in. Obviously, the example in this in the demo is you know fairly simple and meant to be understandable. But those things happen a lot in real life. When you have a complex data structure, and don't even realize you've created a memory cycle that you've now a reference cycle that you've now released and won't garbage won't won't be freed because reference counts never go to zero. Um, so again, I just consider it a good defensive practice to just clear all the outbound references. Again, I wouldn't worry too. I wouldn't worry about the, the platform provided references. We're, we're good about that. You know, we've we've had a lot of time to get those straightened out and fix up those issues. But if you're creating your either in your subclass or just adding things to a content node or even an AA that reference other AAs or content nodes, I would definitely clear those out when you when you free when you release the object. Okay. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes. I mean, yes. Is, yes, you do. <laughs> yeah, these complex channels, you often don't know these things are happening. You just, it's, you know, it just, it, the, it's just the nature of the beast when these channels get more and more complicated. All right, we'll go back and do some auditing again. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm, sure. Hey, thanks, G. Joe. Um, any other questions? As you can see, this is a great opportunity to interact live with our engineers. So definitely, you know, if you've got any questions, anything on your mind, uh, you know, take advantage of this opportunity. Otherwise, I will will ask for a last call. Questions? Okay. So that wraps up our webinar. I thank you all very much for attending and participating. Um, as a reminder, a recording of this webinar will be posted on the Roku Developer site our Roku Developers YouTube channel and the Roku Developers channel within the next few days. Uh, please keep an eye on the Roku Developers blog for announcements on the dates of our next webinars, uh, which will cover exception handling and trick play thumbnails. Obviously we want to uh, resolve our resolution issues before we uh, announce broadcast dates. But anyway, pay attention to the Roku Developers blog, um, the Roku Developers Slack channel, and the Roku Developers Forum, because we'll post the announcement when, of the dates for those webinars. So uh, once again, thank you so much for attending. Have a great day. And as always, happy streaming. Bye now. <laughs>